Revival. Now, Webster's Dictionary will tell you it means restoration to life, consciousness, vigor, strength. Awakening, the act of waking from sleep, or a recognition, realization, or coming into awareness of something. Revival, awakening. Northampton, Massachusetts, 1730s. Jonathan Edwards begins to preach, followed by George Whitfield. Whitfield spoke to thousands in the open air about the concept of spiritual rebirth, while Edwards warned of sinners in the hands of an angry God. Revival swept the colonies. Countless lives began to change. Churches began to change. And history remembers this as the first great awakening. September 23rd, 1857, at lunchtime in New York City, a layman named Jeremy Lanfear kneels to pray. America was in spiritual, political, and economic decline. There was financial panic and rumors of a civil war, and so Lamphere invited thousands to a rented hall on Fulton Street to pray. Six people showed up. Just six people. But those six people began to pray. Three weeks later, 40 people were praying. Within six months, 10,000 people were gathered daily for prayer. Over the next two years, over one million Americans out of a total population of 30 million put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This became known as the Great Prayer Revival. In the early 1970s, the cover of Life magazine featured over 80,000 young people gathering for Jesus at an event in Dallas called Explo 72. A year before, the cover of Time magazine read the Jesus Revolution because something undeniable was happening. Something unexplainable was happening. Something was sweeping young people all over America. It became known as the Jesus Movement and accounted for more baptisms in a single year than any other year in the history of the Southern Baptists. 400,000 people were baptized in one year. The First Great Awakening, the Great Prayer Revival, the Jesus Movement. What's the link? What is the common denominator? What is the first step? How do things like this happen? It's prayer. What is the first step? As I said on the video there, it is prayer. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come to you, that you would even listen to us. And Father, we pray that our hearts would be open to our need for prayer this morning. That we wouldn't forget it, that we wouldn't neglect it, that we wouldn't take it for granted, but Father, we would be in prayer with you daily and we would understand the importance of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue our Rethinking the Church series, we're really going to ask the question, how are we as a church, and really how are you doing with prayer? And we learned last week the importance of protecting doctrine, the importance of guarding the integrity of the gospel message, and this week we'll be discussing the importance and the priority of prayer. In our passage this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll turn there in a second, but the first three words that we're going to see are first of all. The very next lesson young Timothy receives is the priority of prayer. So turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll begin in the verse, first two verses. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Do you know that Prayer meetings essentially are one of the most, if not the most important meetings that a church has, but in the American church is often one of the most neglected meetings. And I ask you, what, why is prayer so neglected? I want to give you a few reasons why that might be. The first might be is we often don't feel like we need it. 
When we are going through a health difficulty, when we're going through an economic crisis, when we're having a relationship strife, that's when we dust off the cobwebs of prayer and begin to pray like never before. But when our finances are fine, relationships are going pretty well, our health seems to be pretty good, we might think we don't need prayer. And I believe that's possible in in church as well. When things are going well financially, everyone seems to be getting along. We still have our religious freedom. So why would we go to prayer? Next might be pride. You know, prayer is a vulnerable activity. You are humbly going to the creator of the universe and basically saying, I cannot do this. And I humbly come before you, God, and ask for help. You are in control, and it's all up to you. And I'm praying. And it takes a laying down of pride to do that. It could be fear. You may have a fear, especially when we pray as a church. You might have a fear of praying in front of people. You might have a fear that the prayer meeting may be boring. You might have a fear that it might last a long time. You might think that if you come to a prayer meeting on Wednesday, you won't leave till Thursday. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet in my 10 years here. I'm not saying it couldn't. <laughs> but your fears may keep you from praying together as a church or as an individual. And the next might be you can't comprehend it. You know, the old question of why should I pray if God already knows what will happen? Pastor Pete Briscoe gave kind of an answer to this, and he said, what if the coach in Michael Jordan's prime decided to put him on the bench in the fourth quarter? Or maybe in the finals or something like that. You would think the reporters would ask that question. That would be their primary question after the game. Why did you put Michael Jordan on the bench in the fourth quarter? And the coach might say, well, I I just couldn't comprehend how he can defy gravity. And I couldn't understand his competitive nature. I, I couldn't put it into words and I couldn't comprehend it. So because we couldn't understand Michael Jordan, we decided to put Michael Jordan on the bench. And I think we do that with prayer as well. We can't quite comprehend it. We can't quite understand it fully. So we decide to put God on the bench. Now, there may be... The next might be, as it's kind of shown in this passage, maybe we don't know how. You know, there's seven Greek nouns that are listed to describe prayer. Four of them are listed for us in this passage. You see it with supplication and prayer and intercession and thanksgiving. Those four kind of overlap in the Greek language. They overlap each other. They kind of build on each other. Kind of tells us that prayer is complex can be very simple and it can be complex there's multiple ways that we can pray from request to thanksgiving and all of these things should be included in our prayer lives and then it's interesting in our passage the next thing that is said it said for all people that we are to pray for all people and the very first type of people as listed is those in authority and Paul really eliminates every excuse from the book here because whether you're in in favor of a of a former president or the president now or the governors or the mayors or you don't agree whatever Paul's like that doesn't matter because it's got nothing on Paul because who was his ruler at the time does anyone know it was Nero The same man that ordered his mother to be killed. That same man that would take Christians and light them on fire in the middle of the street to act as streetlights. The same man that would be responsible for the martyr of Peter, and you guessed it, most likely the man who would murder Paul. Paul is saying in this passage to pray for your rulers, those in authority over you, and at that time it was the man that was eventually going to kill him. So we ain't got nothing on Paul. So we have no excuse for us not to be praying for our authorities. 
for our president, for our governors, for our mayors, the House, the Senate. And not just in government, but we need to be praying for our, our religious leaders as well. I implore you to pray for your pastors. Pray for your deacons. Pray for those that are in leadership of the church. And how do we pray for our leaders, you might ask? Well, pray for wisdom and discernment. I start there. When we think of the important decisions that are made daily and weekly, when we think of the decisions that are made in our government, that the decisions that are made are, n are made for the kingdom of God and not for their own kingdoms. So, even in this short time that we've been together this morning and conversating together, I ask that question again, how are you doing? How are you doing in prayer? I have to be honest, you know, I, I get to preach this to myself all week. And if I was honest, there's often times I do not set a very good example for you as your pastor in prayer. Do I believe that prayer is paramount? Yes. Do I believe that prayer is vital to the Christian life? Yes. Do I pray? Yes. But if I was transparent with you this morning, I was completely convicted that I may be leading our congregation and our church into worshiping a little village God, as John Stott would call it. Where we as a church often pray for our health and our needs, and that is important, and I agree with that. But do we ignore the majesty of our Creator in our prayers? Of the four ways that we pray as a church, is there more begging and less thanksgiving? Is there more supplication and requesting than admiration and praise? And if I was honest with you this morning, the scales would probably be tipped in one way versus another. Another thing I was convicted of this week was praying boldly. Maybe that's what your conviction is as you think of prayer as well, that maybe your faith is missing or it's growing weak, and as a result of that, your prayers are weak and lack courage. And maybe it's just me, but maybe we don't appreciate the wonder of prayer. That we are able to have a conversation to go to the Almighty God and to His throne and be able to talk to Him and He would listen to us. And not be awestruck by that and not reflect or respond immediately with praise and adoration. And that we might come to His throne with these weak and, and penny-sized prayers when God has this ability to unleash His power and His blessings upon us. And the song was very fitting in that thought to pray for God's blessings and what He can provide for us. You know, Bob Goff, in his latest book, raised this question. He said, if God answered every one of your prayers... Would it change anyone's, anybody's life except your own? So if your prayers were answered in this past week, would it make a difference in your family? Would it make a difference in your church? Would it make difference in this world? Would your world change at all? Would it look any different? Are we praying boldly to the throne of grace when we pray? Or if God would answer every request that you had yesterday, would you just have a, a safe ride to work? And would you just feel pretty good and, and maybe just sleep well? Because I think oftentimes we just pray these penny prayers and we're, not, we're lacking courage in our prayers of what God can truly give us and the power that He has at His hands. So Paul is urging us to go to God in supplication in intercession, in thanksgiving, in prayer for all people. And not just for ourselves. 
And do not underwhelm God with your praise and do not underestimate His power. Verse 3 says, this is good and it is pleasing to the sight of our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Charles Spurgeon said this, if the answering of our prayers would dishonor our Lord, We would not pray, but since in this thing he is glorified, we will pray. You see, as it says in our passage this morning, prayer pleases the Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus willingly gave his life for us to be forgiven and for our relationship to be restored to the Father. And that relationship that is restored allows us to have access to the throne as Hebrews explains to us. But notice the emphasis here where it says all people. We just talked about praying for all people and this also talks about the desire for salvation to be to all people. In 2 Peter 3.9, if you're taking notes, you, that is a definite parallel verse there. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it reminds us of William Carey and what was told him, to him before he left for the mission field. This might be familiar to you. He was told to by his church leaders as he prepared to go to the mission field, or at least desired to, They said, young man, if God is going to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or ours. Very thankful he didn't listen to that advice. And it wasn't very long after that he went to India and he became uh, really the father of modern missions and laid the groundwork for that and ended up translating the Bible in as far as we know, at least 44 languages and did incredible work there because salvation is for all. And next we see the position of the mediator. Now, if the position of the mediator was a job posting, there would be only one that could apply for the job. I mean, I guess many could apply for the job, but only one is going to get the job, and that's Jesus. Because Jesus is the God-man. Jesus, as God, is God, can receive our prayer. And Jesus, as man, can sympathize with our prayers. He's the perfect person, perfect God for that position of mediator. Recently, we've been doing some work in our bathroom, and uh, it's much needed for a number of reasons, Um, but we knew something right away was not right, and I don't know anything about construction, but it's come to, anyways, come to find out the duct work um, from the dryer vent to the outside was not properly put together um, upon building, and whether it was nails or screws or duct tape, I don't know. But it wasn't done. So as a result of that, we had a nice, wonderful collection of lint all under our bathtub and walls and everywhere. And I hope that God didn't give us this, give our family this trial for this illustration this morning. <laughs> but it works. Because it is only through Jesus that we gain access to the Father. And he is our conduit to the throne of grace. And just like when the pipes don't work or they are disconnected, it is a mess. It doesn't work. It slows down progress. The same thing when we don't use, not use, but allow Jesus to be our conduit to the throne of grace, when he is not our mediator to the throne, to God Almighty. 
It's a mess. It doesn't work. It slows down our progress. Jesus is the one mediator, the one mediator between God and man. It also makes it clear that this is one God that we're talking about here. For there is one God. If you didn't know what that was a reference to, Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is called the Shema. It's a uh, phrase that is repeated often in the Old Testament. It's one that the Jews would re recite. He is one God. And Paul is referencing that and referring to that on purpose because there was a problem during this culture and during this time and it was coming into the church that you could pray to more than one God. And this false teaching of this culture, Paul wanted to make sure, no, there is one God and there is only one mediator, Christ Jesus. And then in verse 6, spoiler alert, this goes very much with our Easter theme. And I am actually going to save this verse of Jesus being the ransom for all for our Easter time together. So it allows us to move along to verse 7. So don't think I'm skipping 6. We'll come back to that in a few weeks. Okay, verse 7 says, for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. That little side comment. It seems like today's vernacular, you hear, you know, got to be honest. I'm not going to lie. It always worries me when someone says that to me. I'm trying to preface something they're going to say. Well, why do you got to say you're not going to lie? Like, you shouldn't lie to me anyway, but... Paul wanted to make sure that people that were contradicting, contradicting his doctrine, this is the truth here. Those that might be opposing young Timothy in his early ministry, listen, this is the truth. And Paul was appointed a preacher and apostle. That word appointed means to be set or placed. How many of you in here like to play chess? Anyone like to play chess? Okay, good handful of you like to. During when you play chess, if you're a great chess player, you're usually you know one or two or three steps ahead, right? You're placing those pieces in places, setting them in places for hopefully eventual victory. You know, some have accused God of being like a chess player with us, that He would move us as little pawns in his grand scheme with little care to us. And that is not true. God has purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. And as we see in the life of Paul, he was appointed, he was set, he was placed in the right place at the right time for victory. He cares for each of us. And He has placed you and your family and your home and your city and your church for victory. He's appointed you to be in that workplace, in that neighborhood, in that family for a reason. You might wonder, why am I in this family? Or why am I at this job? Or why am I in this neighborhood? I don't believe it's because God is just allowing us to be little pawns in His grand scheme. He doesn't really care where He takes us. No, He cares. There's purpose for it. And every trial that we go through, every difficult that we, difficulty that we have, it's for victory. And some of you in this room have had horrible or difficult upbringings and a difficult childhood or a difficult life. And God can use that for His victory. God can redeem that. And God can appoint you to His purpose as He did with Paul in his life. And God chose him for a purpose. And He chose him to teach the truth and the importance of faith in Jesus Christ. To fight the false teaching of 
worshiping multiple gods and be, to be a messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul knew what he was called to do. And he did it with fervor and he did it with hard work and he did it with passion because he knew that God placed him there. What if we lived that way? What if we lived in a way that we knew that we are appointed to be the place where we needed to be for God's purposes and for His glory? That we could do everything in our life with passion and with hard work because we know that God had placed us there. What a difference that makes. So that, does that describe you? Has God called you out of a life of sin so that you can make the very best macaroni salad? Has God appointed you as a witness to His incredible mercy so that you can have a conversation multiple times this week how it reached 60 degrees? There's nothing wrong with talking about our pasta casseroles or the weather. But when things stop there and we never mention Jesus Christ, and we never mention the testimony as a believer in our conversations during the week, why did God save us? God knew, or Paul knew why he was appointed to that life. And he was willing to give his life for it. So, if you are a greeter at this church, we just talked about being part of the First Impressions team. We'd love to build that team. And if you decide, I'm going to be a greeter at this church, well then, light that welcome center up. Do good work. Work hard. If you've been, a, you've been just recently given a supervisor position at work, then follow in the servant leadership of Jesus Christ and His example at work and be a testimony there. Where has God appointed you? Be principled in your purpose. Have direction. Have passion. Have some drive in whatever God has appointed you to do. And then Paul says he's a teacher of the Gentiles. See, the gospel to the Gentiles really now became Paul's ministry focus. And really, that passed along to Timothy and became his ministry focus as well. God's people, that phrase, was expanding in its definition. There were many Jews that would say, listen, if you're not a Jew, then you're not part of God's family. That other races and ethnicities were not included into God's family. May that never describe our church. Never. Instead, let our church be a church where all races are welcome to sit and serve and worship together where we recognize individuality, where we recognize each other's cultures, but we can still come together and treat each other as family and as brothers and sisters in Christ. Where the poor and the rich share communion together, where we are all community reaching community together. I think Paul, this is just my opinion, I think Paul put that in there as a lesson to Timothy to understand where the gospel was spreading. It wasn't just to the Jews. It was to all. So I encourage you to find your purpose. And as you search, if you discover your purpose in life has nothing to do with faith and has nothing to do with truth, then you need to be searching and asking God for that purpose and design an appointment in life. Next, in verses 8 through 15, we see the proper prayer participation. Let's start in verse 8. I desire then in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, 
with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So, what does public prayer look like? If we're going to encourage praying as a church together, men and women, what does that look like? Well, the first thing it says in our passage is, I desire in every place. I desire in every place to pray. So that means in the church, right? Prayers should have a place in every room and in every ministry of the church. What does that look like? That means as a when a new mother drops off a baby for the first time in the nursery, maybe that's a good time to pray with her. That means in our children's ministry, in our little preschoolers, as we talked about this morning, our beloved preschoolers, that we would pray with them and maybe teach them what it means to be still and be quiet as we pray to the Lord. And for our children's ministry, instilling into them as we pray together that as they get older and they understand that mommy and daddy are not always going to be there, but who is? God will be there. And teaching that dependence on God through prayer. And our teens and young adults, as they begin to wrestle with doubt, that that doubt wouldn't push them away from God, but it would bring them closer to them through prayer. And then adults... This also means if we're going to pray in every place, that means we need to pray with each other. That there really shouldn't be a Sunday that goes by where we don't see people praying before and after services and in the hallways together. Something I've been convicted of this week, that many times we say what? I'll pray for you. Why not just do it right then? Before or after the service, in the hallways of this church, over the phone. You say you're going to pray for someone. Why don't you just pray for them right there? Desire in every place in the church. That also means in the home. A little boy, and this is not a true story if you're thinking, um, but a little boy was saying his bedtime, story, bedtime prayers with his mother. He said, Lord, bless mommy and daddy. And God, give me a new bicycle, he shouted. And his mom said, you know, God, God's going to hear you. You don't, you don't need to shout. And he says, he says, I know, Mom, but Grandma's in the next room, and she's hard of hearing. <laughs> now, I confess that we need more prayer in our house, too. And sometimes it ends up a little bit like this. Maybe you have that confession too, that you know that you need to bring prayer more inside your house. Whether it's praying with your spouse, whether it's praying with your roommates, whether it's praying with your children, whether it's praying with the guests that come in your home. And for our kids and teens, when was the last time you prayed with your sibling? When was the last time you prayed with mom and dad? We need to bring prayer in the home. And even if it's a two-year-old that just says five words, it's beautiful. We need to pray in our home and let prayer be a fabric, be a staple, be a constant in every place. If you underline in your Bible, underline those three words. And then it specifically talks about men and women. And it talks about men. We're going to be, as it, in our passage, it begins with you. It talks about holy hands lifted. First of all, it is okay to lift your hands in prayer and worship if it's humbly done. 
Andrew Knowles says it this way, an outward gesture ought to express the inner attitude. It's actually a common practice for godly men. If you, if you read through the Old Testament, you will see godly men lifting their hands in prayer. And the Jews in the Old Testament, God's chosen people, would actually wash their hands before prayer. And then when it's talking about lifting holy hands, they would lift with palms up, almost like a beggar before the king. A perfect illustration of what prayer is. But I really believe the point here is not so much the posture, but the heart. The heart is the priority. It's that goal of holiness, to be free of anger, to be full of forgiveness. Let me explain what that might mean, where it says, without anger or quarreling, Warren Wiersbe says this, Christians should learn to disagree without being disagreeable. A lot of disagreements can be settled by beginning and ending with prayer. You disagree with someone in the church, you have a problem with so-and-so, yes, you need to talk it out, but allow prayer to be part of that discussion. Not anger, not fighting. Prayer becomes the antithesis of quarreling. At least I hope so. I hope you wouldn't pray, Lord, rain down trouble on this man's life. Let every day feel like a Monday to him. That he might have three paper cuts this week. Amen. We don't pray that way for each other. We pray in in a situation of anger and quarreling and fighting with someone that we might pray like this, Lord, humble my heart that I may see the wrong that I have done to this person. That I may make this right. Forgive us for fighting with each other and not fighting for each other. So listen, if there are those in this church that have a disagreement with someone, it's very possible that there's someone listening right now that is holding on to a grudge, holding on to a disagreement. Well, I want to encourage you to pray it out. Come together, have a word of prayer, talk about what's going on, and then end your time in prayer together. Because the disagreements between us as a church will only cause more division. Which brings us to the next step of what really needs to happen after that discussion, after prayer together, and it's forgiveness. Why? Because we we cannot pray to a forgiving God with an unforgiving heart. Mark 11, chapter, Mark 11, 25 says this, Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. I think that about covers it. So men, how do you pray in the church? With humility, with holiness, and with a heart that is full of forgiveness. Not only asking for forgiveness, but also giving it to others. And then with International Women's Day being this past week, and also the kickoff of the women's ministry being this Saturday at 10 a.m. Got that in the message at the church. It's also appropriate the rest of our passage is about women. Now, women, you may be wondering why the men only get one verse and you get the next seven verses applied to you. Well, one of the reasons may very well may be, I don't know, but this could be the reason. Who was this written to? This was written to a man, a man that might need more understanding of women in the church. I'm sure Paul, as a mentor, as an apprentice, went over multiple lessons with Timothy over time. Maybe there was was this lesson where he needed a little extra instruction. So we begin in verses 9 and 10 and talking about women and prayer and their behavior, the behavior of women in prayer. The first word we see is modest. 
And that word means decent and orderly. And I hope that we don't misunderstand the text and what it is saying, because I believe that this text is often misunderstood. I believe that this, I do not, sorry, I do not believe that this text is forbidding jewelry or having your hair did. That's not what it's saying. But if we break it down culturally, Ephesus was a very affluent city. And it's very likely that women of the church were drawn into that affluence and would braid their hair with gold and pearls and dress with expensive clothes. And they were, and they were being excessive for the wrong reasons, for attention to rise on the social ladder. I don't say this tongue-in-cheek. I want to say this seriously. This is NBC, not MTV. There should be a difference in how a woman dresses for worship versus how she might dress on the red carpet. This is difficult for me as a man to address this. I'm doing the best I can. But the second thing it also says is godliness. And here's the point. A woman is to act and dress according to godliness. It is an inner quality that affects their outer behavior. And I do not believe that we need to be hung up on the examples that Paul gives us in this passage about braided hair or expensive clothes or golden pearls. I believe this is a cultural example for us. It's not a sin to dress nicely, to wear jewelry, to have your hair styled. However, there is reason to believe the point of this passage is for women of the church and in our church to be known for godliness, to be known for good works, to be known what you're doing in your community, not for the designer of your clothes or the designer of your shoes. It's interesting, the instructions for men and women are quite similar here, and it is those two words of humility and godliness. That's the point. That's the foundational principle. That's how men and women should pray. That's how men and women should live. To conduct yourself in a way that is respectable and godly, in prayer, and in life. And I hope that is the message that is to be heard today. And then, in verses 11 through 14, we see the woman's role in the church. The first that is listed there is a submissive role. Let me begin by saying that the complementarian view of women in the home and in the church can be represented incorrectly, and it can be manipulated grossly. As we discussed a few months ago in our Colossians study, that word submit or submissiveness can be misused. Never. Never does that word mean that a woman could be a servant of a man. Never does that mean that it is a less than culture, that a woman is less than a man. It is not what that means. Never should a woman be treated as a possession. And in marriage as it is presented in Scripture... Is much greater than that, much purer. It means that submissive word is talking about how a woman shows honor to her husband and she does so willingly, not forcibly, as she submits to the leadership of the home. And we believe Scripture tells us that there is similarity of the leadership of the home as there is the leadership of the church. Which brings us to the next role of women in the church, and that is a valued role. And what does that look like? Well, the, our 
Constitution here at Memorial states this. Men hold positions of leadership over the congregation in general. This includes the offices of pastors, deacons, and trustees, as well as adult teaching situations that include men. But it also states later, we recognize and appreciate the interdependence of believing men and women to accomplish the work of God in and through this church. May I say that we must be careful not to undervalue, underappreciate, or underestimate the women's role in the church. And how dare anyone use this piece of Scripture to devalue a woman or to devalue a woman in her role in the body of Christ. We believe that Scripture is clear in the leadership of the church, which is not a very popular belief today. However, what we have learned today, what we have read today, should never hold us back from celebrating from encouraging, from upholding, from appreciating women in our church. Women who are in our church teaching part of the music ministry, art and design, hospitality, mentoring, counseling, meals, insight, budget, finance, technology, outreach, clerk and records, personal evangelism, church office, first impressions, Bible study. I could keep going. Thank you, women, for what you do in our church. And the list goes on in God's Word as well. This is not just from my mouth. It's also from God's Word. In the Old Testament, it includes examples of prominent examples of godliness with Ruth, boldness with Miriam, life change with, Han- with Rahab, perseverance in Hannah, courage in Esther, and the bravery of Jehoshaphat. And Jesus walked into a society that saw women as second-class citizens. And he turned that right around and he he allowed a, a young single lady to walk alongside him and the 12 disciples. He allowed women to be the last ones there to bury him and the first ones there at his resurrection. He sent the Samaritan woman out to be a missionary, essentially. The early church saw great women of faith like Dorcas and Lydia and Priscilla and Phoebe. In your own study, just take a stroll in Romans chapter 16 and you'll see ten women of faith there. The point in this passage is not to be misused to silent women to bring them down. It's quite the opposite. I believe that this passage can encourage godliness and humility, can provide purpose and allow women to find their role in the body of Christ that is uniquely designed for you. And I hope that, and maybe you have a past of this 1 Timothy 2 being abused in your life and and misused. And I hope from this time forward that as you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 as a woman, as a woman of God, that you would find that as encouraging to you, uplifting to you, helping you find your design and purpose in the body of Christ. A valued role at Memorial Baptist Church. As we close, I want to share... A church member asked G. Campbell Morgan, do you think we ought to pray about even the little things in life? And Dr. Morgan replied, Madam, can you think of anything in your life that is big to God? So men and women, teens and children of NBC, it is my prayer that we would be a praying church. For all the things, all the time, for all people. That we might pray to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that we might pray with humility, that we might pray to find purpose in serving the body of Christ, that we might pray with each other and for each other. And may today be a reminder to pray for all and pray all the time. So let's do that together. Let's pray. Father, what a rich passage this morning. Help us, Lord, to walk away convicted because there's not anyone in this room that cannot grow in their prayer life. So please, Lord, convict our hearts of what we must do to pray more, to pray in more places, to pray for more people. Lord, help us to pray all the time. Lord, that we may come to you with thanksgiving, with our prayers, that we may plead for intercession. And Lord, where there's time that we need to just beg for help. Let us come to you. Let us not depend on our own selves, but depend on you and prayer. Thank you for prayer. Thank you that we can come to the throne. Help us to do it more often. Help us to do it humbly and with holiness. In Jesus' name, amen.